All right, so last week we took a look at what it meant to find the area between two curves, and then we jumped from the world of two dimension to the world of three dimension. Um, and today we are going to continue that conversation. Uh, in fact, for the rest of the semester, we'll be looking at things that are in three dimension. Um, I think I said this before, but sometimes the visualizing piece that we're going to do can be really challenging. Um, and it's not that you can't do it. It just means that it's something new that you're being learned to, or you're being asked to learn how to do. Um, and it takes a lot of practice. And I think that looking at pictures and different animations online are definitely uh, tools that will be useful in helping you develop this skill. Okay. Um, so if you're not feeling the visualization, that's okay. It comes with a lot of practice. Uh, and there are a bazillion resources out there on the interweb to uh, support you in that practice. Okay, so we're going to be starting to take a look at something called the DISC method today. Okay, so the DISC method. Um, sometimes this method is also known as the washer method. And so when you hear disk method or washer method, the question we're really asking ourselves is what happens when the cross sections are circles? Okay. What happens when the cross sections are circles? And so if we sort of go back to last week. Okay. So I'm going to scroll up on the screen. If we go back to all these pictures that we were looking at, we looked at a lot of different types of slices that maybe we had triangles, maybe we had rectangles or squares, semicircles, quarter circles, all of that, um, all of those shapes we talked about. But the one shape we didn't talk about was circles. Like what happens if you slice something and you end up with a bunch of circles? Okay. And so that's exactly where we're going to go today. All right. So we're shifting gears a little bit. Last week, it was decision making. What kind of shape do we have? And then we use that area formula. And so we remembered that the area of a rectangle is length times width, that the area of a triangle is one half base times height. And we were even able to come up with formulas for a quarter circle, so pi over 4 r squared, and then semicircles, pi over 2 r squared. And so before we head back down to where we're going to start today, uh, can someone remind us of what the area formula for just a regular circle is? Pi r squared. Excellent, excellent. All right, so if the question tells you a specific shape, you better be thinking, what area formulas do I know? However, if the formula or if the question doesn't tell us necessarily a specific shape, there's other context clues we can use to figure out, hey, they're asking us for a circle. Okay. So let's scroll back down to where we're starting today. All right, so let's jot that down before we forget that what happens when the cross sections are circle that we will have area equals pi r squared. All right, so washer method is sort of an unfortunate name because I think sometimes when we think of a washer, we think of doing our laundry um, and so that's sort of a confusing word to think about. Um, but how many of you in here have ever assembled furniture? Like maybe from Ikea or Target, or I don't know where you get your furniture from. OK, so some people have put together furniture. Some people have not. Uh, I actually quite like it. I find it very soothing to sort of put things together and make sure that it all fits. Um, 
Um, but there is, uh, and it doesn't have to be furniture per se, but if you've ever done anything in terms of um, building, then maybe you've seen, uh, let's see, what kind of things normally come in a tool kit for when you are building um, furniture? Well, they might provide some screws. They might provide um, bolts. They might provide a wrench, good old Ikea. Um, but they also occasionally have washers. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know. I've never, uh, I mean, I've used a hammer before, but that hasn't necessarily come in the toolkit of things that I wanted from the store. I had to sort of have that hammer prior to building things. Um, but when you are sort of, uh, or if you go to Home Depot, you know, you're looking in that construction aisle, there's screws, bolts, wrenches, washers. And so in the context of building a washer is actually that um, piece that comes in your furniture kit or whatever it is that you're building that is sort of like a flat disc and kind of looks like that. Okay, so washers in the name washer method actually refers to the one that you would see in the uh, construction of things section. Yes, the ring kind of thing. Okay, so it looks like a ring, um, maybe not the kind you wear on your finger, but it is sort of a circle, another circle, and then this is like the solid part. Okay. Um, you might also, when I think about washers, I actually, uh, how many of you out there like donuts? Anybody a donut fan? No donut fans? Oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, all the donuts, all the donuts. Um, so, Donuts come sort of in two types, right? If we think about donuts, uh, if we think about donuts, we have the sort of the kind that um, I think Laura was talking about, the ones that are filled, uh, maybe the jelly donut or a Boston cream donut or any of the fancier donuts that we see that just have like stuff inside of them chocolate filled, cream filled. Yeah, I don't know if anybody here has been to Dunkin' Donuts, um, but I grew up on the East Coast. And so Dunkin' Donuts was like a big thing for us growing up. And uh, they have this one filled donut. It's literally filled with like frosting. Like it's not even like jelly or like a cream, like it's just frosting. Like they just squeeze frosting into the donut. Uh, but after I ran the Boston Marathon, that is exactly what I wanted to eat. And it was very, very delicious. Um, but when we're thinking about donuts, we've got sort of the filled donuts variety where there's no, uh, oh, well, that's okay. More donuts for me then. The filled variety that has no hole in the middle that you can sort of look through um, versus the kind of donut that we might think is a little bit more traditional. That's definitely off center, but that's okay. Um, where it is just like a good old old fashioned donut or maybe even like the one from the Simpsons where there's the pink frosting around the outside, right? Um, but there is sort of our more regular donut, All right? And now when we're thinking about the disc method and the washer method, I think they would have been so much more relatable if we were like the donut method, okay? And so what we're really gonna be talking about today is um, how can we figure out volume by taking these slices, okay? So now we're saying we're slicing things just like we did last week, but everything we're slicing, every slice, is now a circle. That is the cross section, okay? And so for that reason, we're gonna be using a lot of pi r squared today, okay? Now, if we think about um, the picture all the way to the right-hand side, okay? 
uh, this one right here. Is this like a filled donut or is it like a regular donut? An illegal way to eat pizza without the crust. Yes, that is actually also another way to think about that for our friends who are more of the savory sort. Um, but when we think about this very right hand diagram, the one with the blue circle and the red radius, do we think that that's going to be more like a filled donut or a regular donut? It's like a regular donut, right? Um, well, if this one, sorry, are you talking about this one right here? The one on the right? Ah. Yeah, this one is going to be more like the filled donut, right? There's no hole in the middle. So when we think about a filled donut, if we were looking for just the area, right? We imagine that like maybe you had a donut and maybe you like to like smash your donuts flat when you eat them. I don't know. But if you were looking for the area of your donut, you would just say, well, it'd be pi times whatever the radius is squared, right? Now, in the second diagram, though, we're looking more at like a traditional donut. Or if you go to build something and these little flat rings come out of the instruction packet or the, the toolkit that sort of taped to the inside of the box, that kind of washer. Or now that some, there are some like really fancy washing machines, if you look at just sort of the front part of the washing machine, you might be able to imagine, that's a terrible color. Uh, you might be able to imagine that also terrible, still terrible, Judy. Uh, you might be sort of able to imagine that you've got like sort of an inside and an outside when you think about the front of a front loading washing machine, which I think is, far less exciting than donuts. Um, however, when we try and find the area here or this area, how could we modify our regular area of a circle equation to get just the area of the frosting or maybe just the gray part in the picture how could we find just that area, not the whole area, but just the part that is gray? Hmm. All right, we've got one guess in there. That is pi, a big R plus little r squared minus pi, little r squared. Okay, so. I like that we sort of put this in words that an area of a washer might be the area of the big circle minus the area of the little circle, right? If we're gonna be very technical here and assume that our circles are sort of drawn to scale, we're gonna find the area of the big circle and then we're gonna take away the area of the small circle. Now, I think that perhaps if this diagram were drawn a little bit better, it might be more clear that the big R is actually this whole radius right there, while the little r is just the inner part. And so knowing that, how might we modify this equation that uh, Ethan has suggested here in the chat? No, no, you're fine. I completely understand where that came from. I think this is a diagram issue, not a user issue. <laughs> that's true. Topology has talked a lot about donuts and how that's the same as so many other things. Um, but how might we modify this 
equation. So how could we say the area of the big circle uh, using the letters that we have here? Yeah, we could just say pi, and this is so official, but the bigger radius, we just use a capital R, okay? So I don't think that there's anyone in this class who writes like this, but if you are an all capital letters writer, just make sure that one of your R's is larger than the other one, okay? So pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. Okay, um, where the little r is the smaller radius and the big R is the bigger radius, okay? Now, let's do one more thing. We know as mathematicians that when we are um, integrating or taking a derivative that it is beneficial to us to take the constants and sort of bring them all out to the front before we start getting into all of the nitty gritty computations. And so what might we want to write uh, for this expression so that we've sort of prepared ourselves to make derivative or integral taking easier? Yeah, let's go ahead and take out that pi. Pi is a constant, okay? We have now reached the phase in our academic careers where it's okay for something to be in terms of pi, right? It also happens to be the greatest common factor between both terms. And so what we're left with is big R squared minus little r squared, okay? And so this one is gonna be like our regular donut, all right? And when we see a situation where there might be a hole in the middle, we're gonna need to make sure we subtract a second area to compensate for that, okay? Whereas if we have a filled donut, like a jelly donut, man, I could really go for one of those right now. If we had like a jelly donut, we just need to find our pi r squared. So here is a little blurb that I will leave you to read um, on your own time. Uh, but I do want to point out a few things. I know, I know, P donuts, pizza, pie, construction. What a waste of time. What are we doing? Just kidding. It's hopefully relatable. OK, so one thing that we are going to be taking a look at now is we are going to be talking about da, 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 what might be a good color. Okay. Something called an axis of revolution. Okay. Now, the axis of revolution is nothing more than the axis that we are going to take a certain function and revolve that function around, okay? So this is sort of the weird part in the sense that we're looking for, we have a picture of a graph, okay? Um, but we're gonna revolve it around an axis. And when we revolve that around the axis, we're gonna get a three-dimensional shape. And so we can sort of see here that if we had Oh, those purple lines that we were drawing, right? If we had sort of this purple line that we've been drawing in like all of the pictures we ask for, and we take that purple line and we sort of swing it around the axis that we want to revolve it around, we end up with a disc. After we revolve, that's not revolve. After we revolve a line, we obtain a circle. Okay. 
So this rectangle, remember we've been drawing our rectangles super, super skinny. So they've been like a line, okay? But when we take this line and we revolve or rotate this around an axis, we actually end up with a circle, okay? So let me pause for a moment right here. How are we feeling with this idea that if we take a line and we revolve it, we end up with a circle? Oh, I see something in the chat, like drilling a hole. Not quite, not quite. Let me see if I can draw maybe a picture more in line with what we've seen. So let's say that we have some axes, okay? And let's say that we had a function, good old function. And let's say we drew a line this way, okay? So just that line. Actually, I don't think we need that function. So let's just say we had a line, a vertical line, okay? And I want to take this line and I'm going to make it go all the way around the axis, okay? I'm going to make it go all the way around the axis. When I'm done rotating this around the axis or revolving this around the axis, if I look at it from sort of this end, I'll end up with a circle where the radius of this circle is that line that I started with. Does that make a little bit more sense? Okay. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for a moment. Uh, and can you all see me? You can, right? Yeah, okay. I know, great Monday morning hair situation happening. Okay, so let's say that you had that line, right? So, oh, wait, I need to turn that off. All right, so let's say that we have, that's too large. Ooh, I should have better props ready to go in the morning, my goodness. Okay, let's say that we have our purple line, right? And if we revolve it around the axis, we're sort of looking to do something like this, okay? Where this is the axis. So I'm revolving it around. And if I say, hey, look from the side, like what shape is it? Because when I do this, all you see is a line. But if you look from the side, what you're gonna see is this line sort of went around that axis and created a circle, okay? So yes, exactly. So this is touching the axis of revolution and we're gonna sort of swivel around it and end up with a circle, okay? This is perhaps the worst animation that I've done. It's a little bit harder to do uh, remote, but still I should have been better prepared. Okay, so as we think about that, um, let's talk about more food. Anybody ever gone to a grocery store that had a deli section where they have like turkey or ham. Okay, so if you go to the uh, deli section and some of the meats come in like a circle shape, right? It's sort of like a long cylinder of meat. And then you're like, you walk up to the counter and you're like, oh, I would like, uh, 
one pound of ham, please. And then they take like the cylinder of ham out and they put it on the slicing machine and they slice. And each slice that you get is a circle. If you started out with a circle shaped, right? And so that's really maybe another way to think about that. That if you're in the deli section, you happen to see like a log of ham or a log of cheese that happens to have or circular cross sections. When you slice them, you'll end up with a bunch of circles. Okay. And so what we're really doing is we're trying to say, hey, if we had this line, we revolved it around and we ended up with circles. We're almost making that log of ham or that log of cheese, where if we stack them all together, we add them all up, we will get some sort of shape. Okay. Now, there are many uh, visual things out there on the interweb to help uh, support your understanding of this. And I think that would actually be a really good thing to sort of um, try out as you, after this lesson, just kind of go peruse the interweb, see what kind of animations are out there. Um, because I think that, you know, again, we're used to looking for resources that may give us examples, but maybe that visual piece is like another thing to look out for when you're trying to pick a good resource, okay? So that being said, we're going to go through a bunch of problems today. My goal is to work through as many problems as we can. Um, since these are sort of stationary notes, um, I've tried to take different clips of the pictures to help us visualize things. Um, but I would definitely encourage you to look for resources that maybe help you see things a little bit better. Okay. In particular, Desmos does great things, but only in two dimension. Okay, so I love Desmos. There's so many things I love about it, but it's really only powerful in two dimension. There is a different platform called GeoGebra. Also does great things. And are in 2D. And so we've been using a lot of Desmos, but I would encourage you to maybe look up GeoGebra things uh, like GeoGebra, rotations of solids, volume, that kind of thing. And I bet you'll find some pretty neat resources. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at this question. Okay. So example number six. Example number six says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals x squared minus 4x plus 5 and the x-axis from 1 to 4 about the x-axis. And so let's sort of unpack where all this information in the word problem where does that appear on the diagram, okay? So even though I'm providing pictures of the diagram here, I want us to make sure we can go from a straight up word problem with no pictures to a picture and labeling it in a way that is supportive, okay? So Let's see, we've got this red curve here in the picture. So let's go ahead and make this red. All right, we've got y equals x squared minus 4x plus 5. And that is the sort of part of the parabola that we see in the picture. OK, so this is our parabola. And that should be the equation y equals x squared minus 4x plus 5. Now, why is it that I'm only having part of the parabola? Like, why wouldn't I draw the whole parabola? Okay. 
Perfect. Great job. Because I'm only looking for from bounding from one to four. Okay, so let's sort of bring that out a little bit more. One to four is this one to that four. Okay, so in other words, we're starting our slices at one, and we are counting all of the slices all the way up until four. Okay. Oops. So we're starting and stopping. They sneak that in, they tell us the bounds, but they don't say these are the bounds. Now we have sort of a top function here, the x squared minus 4x plus 5. Where is the bottom function here? Where is the bottom function? Nice, nice. So the bottom of this shape is actually, in fact, just the x-axis, right? This right here is the x-axis, and that is sort of our bottom function. And that's why this little green region that you see here only goes until the x-axis, OK? Now, the last piece of this, which is sort of real tiny right here, you've got the x-axis and you've got sort of a little circle arrow thing, OK? Now, that comes from this piece right here that when it says we are rotating about the x-axis, that tells us that this right here is our axis of revolution. And so our axis of revolution tells us what line we are sort of spinning our rectangles around, OK? Now, if we were to draw purple lines like we've been doing in this green region, which direction feels most natural to draw those purple lines? Like vertically or horizontally? Vertically, good. Now, why vertically? Well, if I draw them vertically, some random rectangles, every single one of these rectangles will have the red curve on top and the black curve on the bottom. So they have the same top and bottom. And What's the other clue that we should draw these rectangles vertically? There's one more clue. So the other clue that I think is sometimes a little hidden is that the bounds they give you, if the bounds are x values, OK, and not all the time, but if the bounds are x values, that can be a good indicator that your rectangles will sort of follow along in that direction, OK? Let's be careful about. Uh, getting clues from the axis of revolution, OK? The only reason I say that is because the game changes again on Wednesday when we learn a different method, OK? So the game is always changing. And so we want to be really thoughtful about what clues we're looking for. Some of those clues will work for some cases, whereas other clues will actually work in all cases, all right? All right, now before we move on, this purple line, these purple lines that we just drew, what do they represent? Like at the end, when I rotate, I'm going to end up with a circle. 
but what do these purple lines represent? Ah, both really good guesses. Okay, so we have a guess for the radius. And we have a guess for the diameter. Love it. Okay, now I love that we're guessing things that are part of a circle, right? Because we don't wanna say length or base or height because we're looking, if we take that line and we revolve it, we're gonna end up with some sort of circle. So this line actually represents something within our circle, okay? So let's look at these pictures. So this first picture uh, I like because it helps me see when I am taking a two-dimensional shape and I am revolving it, what I actually get, okay? And so if I were to think about uh, sort of maybe this purple line right here, that might be like somewhere here. When I revolve that, it will give me a circle, okay? But maybe the most obvious one is if I take the line at four and I rotate it, I end up with this, like the very last circle. What is the radius of this circle? This very last circle here. Yeah, it is kind of hard to tell, right? I think it's about five as well. I would say that the radius here is about five. But if I wanted to say it in terms of the function, like in other words, if I wanted to use function notation, how else could I say the radius is five? Like what's another way? of using function notation to answer that question. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. We have one guess for f of five. Do we think that if we plug five into our function, we will get a radius of five? Or what do we think? Maybe it'd be helpful to see that formula again. We think five is the same as f of five. Hmm, another guess for f of four. Okay. What do we think here, folks? I think David was spot on. I would say that radius is five. The question now is, is that the same as f of five or is it the same as f of four? <laughs> okay, so let's let's go ahead and, and get rid of that, right? We're not looking for f of five. If we're thinking about function notation, we're saying what x value is getting us that y value, right? So we could say that that is f of four. And the f of four, I think, is a little bit more powerful than five because when we think about plugging things into our equation in just a little bit, we are going to want to use some sort of equation because every one of these circles, like some of them are really big, like this last one, 
but some of them are smaller, some of them are medium size. In fact, they're all kind of different sizes. And so this function notation is gonna be a more powerful way of saying that, okay? So let's kind of try that uh, over here. This circle right here, right? This circle right here. Huh. Do, what do we think is that radius, both in the actual radius and in function notation? So not the very one, last one, but sort of this one kind of between two and four. Maybe about 2.5, okay? So if we say that's about 2.5, and again, that's a great value to figure out, but how do we tie that back to function notation? F of three, nice, nice, okay? So, Again, we can sit and try and find the radius of every single circle, but if we can get it into some sort of equation, then we're just going to be able to find the integral and then add up every single air, every single circle in the entire interval and find that volume. Okay. And so let's kind of go back to a question that we had earlier, radius or diameter. What are our thoughts about these purple lines now? Well, wow. radius or diameter? Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, so it's okay to put out a guess and have it be incorrect, because I think those two guesses were the most educated guesses we could have put forth, right? But it's okay to be like, I'm not really sure, is it the radius or is it the diameter? Now, once we revolve it, we will notice that it is the radius, which is perfect because the equation we're looking for let me write down two equations. Which one of those equations are we going to need? Area equals pi r squared or area equals pi big r squared minus pi little r squared? Yeah, in other words, if I look at each of these over here, like this, is there a hole in the middle, right? There's no hole in the middle. This is like a jelly donut all the way through and through. We've got this, also no hole in the middle. If we were to sort of look at the end circle, no hole in the middle. So the way we can kind of tell from our diagram is that the area that we have actually touches the axis of revolution. There's no gap, there's no space there. But the area that we're shading in actually touches the axis of revolution, okay? Another way to think about that is that the purple line you draw does that touch your axis of revolution or not? And if it does touch, then you've got a filled in donut, okay? And if it, we'll see later on, does not touch, then we'll be looking at the second formula, okay? So, We've done a lot of pre-thinking for this. Now we're actually going to get into setting up the integral, OK? So if we set up our integral, we're looking at the end of the day for the volume. And when we think about volume, right, one of the sort of general formulas that we used a lot last week was that volume equals the integral of area, right? That's how we set up 
every time we talked about something with volume. Now, given these pictures that we're looking at, would you say that the circles are stacked along the x-axis or stacked along the y-axis? Yeah, these circles are being stacked along the x-axis, right? And more significantly, we're going to start at one, we're going to stop at four. And so we can know that we're going to have some sort of dx situation, OK? So let's set this up. I know that I have my integral from one to four. What area formula do I want to use here? Pi r squared, right? And how do we know it's going to be pi r squared? Because they didn't say anywhere in here, oh, the cross sections are circles. So what was our clue that we were going to use pi r squared? Yeah, that rotating part is telling us pi r squared, OK? I know a lot of times we're like, well, I don't know, it's just the section we're in, so we're just using pi r squared. But that decision-making piece, I think, the more we can sort of think about that decision-making, the easier it becomes like on exam day to make those decisions for ourselves, okay? So we are gonna use pi r squared, and because we're revolving or rotating about the axis. So we've got pi, and I'm gonna have radius, squared dx, okay? Now, this is something that I noticed folks struggled with on quiz 14, which is some people just put an R here, which is absolutely fine. You can put R, you don't have to write out the whole word radius, but sometimes I write out the word because what some people did is they left this as an R and then they, they seemed confused because there's like an R and an X. And I think we all know on some level, we can't like mix and match those letters. So then people got kind of stuck. Like, how do we know what the radius is? But the I write it out as the word radius because it brings me back to that purple line, right? the radius changes for every single circle that we have here. Some of them are small, some of them are large, and there's a bunch in the middle. But every single radius is actually defined by the function that was given. So when David said, oh, the radius is five, he really said, well, when I plug in four and I do some math, I'm going to end up with five. So we wrote f of four as sort of another way of getting to David's answer, right? And similarly, the radius of this other circle, David said, was 2.5. And we know that means if you put uh, three into this function, you'll end up with 2.5, okay? So what if I wanted to find any radius in this diagram, right? Any radius, let's move this up here. So radius equals any in the interval one to four. How could we use function notation to write radius as sort of a general thing for this picture? Excellent, f of x, that 
we found one number, but we said, what's a, what's a better way to write that? Better in the sense that it gives us the ability to write all the other ones, right? F of four, F of three, any function here, that radius is gonna be F of X. So what do we do? We go to where it says radius, and instead of radius, we write x squared minus 4x plus 5. So we get pi, the integral from 1 to 4 of x squared minus 4x plus 5 squared dx. So for folks that got a little bit stuck on quiz 14 about how do you write the radius or whatever you're looking for, I hope that made it a little bit more clear how that connects to the equations you're given, okay? Now, we are not going to work through this entire problem. We will talk about some key points where folks are likely to make a mistake. And then I'll give you sort of the goal answer so you know what to look for. But let's say you are doing this problem. What is, you think, the number one wrong answer someone would do for this part right here? Actually, I think there's maybe three super common mistakes that are about to happen, all of which I would like you to not make. All right, there's one. X to the fourth minus 16X squared plus 25 DX. And we're gonna put a big fat red X over this. This one, the mistake is did not distribute, right? You didn't foil out, you just squared every single term and said, I'm just gonna call it a day, All right? So we don't want that mistake. We also, Christy and I missed yours uh, in my excitement to get to the other wrong answer. That is also a really common mistake. People are like, well, I don't know, that's squared. Sometimes I just forget about it, right? So this one is wrong because you did not square. And some of you I noticed on the quiz made that mistake where it was like a square root function and then you didn't square it. So then your integral got really gross because you still had like fractional powers in there. So just make sure that you're still following the structure of the question. If the structure is pi r squared, did you square whatever you had here? Okay. Um, any other mistakes that folks are like, oh, I've made this mistake before, or, oh, I've seen other people make this mistake before. I think those are probably the top two, but I'm just curious if there's any others that are sort of speaking to you right now. Yeah, maybe distributing the pie and then making it, <laughs> making it even harder for yourself. Okay, so that's certainly a possible mistake. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else have I seen? Uh, I would say I've also seen folks like they distribute. correctly, ah, correctly, but sign mistakes. Okay, so one whole line of potential mistakes that we hope to avoid, right? 
Yeah, sometimes people forget to integrate. Sometimes people don't plug in the bounds, right? There's so many areas that it could go wrong, right? <laughs> which is which is what makes these things hard, right? Um, but if you distribute things out properly, what you end up getting, all right? So we'll just kind of skip a few steps, but I would encourage you to work through these and try and connect the dots yourself. You should end up with, uh, what do we want to take the integral of? x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 26x squared minus 40x plus 25x. Right, so after you multiply everything out, you should get that, right? There's a lot of places to make sign mistakes there. So just make sure you get to that as sort of a touch point. And then as you keep going, um, all of these only should require power rule, right? So we don't have anything too fancy here, lots and lots of power rule. We just wanna make sure we do it correctly. But at the end of the day, we would end up with 78 pi over five. Okay. So these questions, um, as you are working through them, I think the decision making process is going to get a lot faster. Okay, so as we do more and more, I'm going to try and be asking questions that I hope you ask yourself as you're working through these questions. All right. So if you get stuck, and you think about the questions that I ask, if they're helpful in getting you unstuck, maybe you sort of write those down for yourself so you can think about like, how do you get yourself unstuck when you're working through a question like this, okay? So let's go ahead and take a break. This seems like a good time to take a break. Um, when we come back, we will work mostly on setting up things, drawing pictures, um, and seeing how we can make sure that we've identified how to use the equations we're given, like this one, and like figuring out, is it the radius? Is it the big radius? How do we know, all right? So it is 1035. Let's maybe be back at 1045. All right. And I'll see you folks back here in a little bit. Okay, let's see. Question in the chat. Multiply the integral of f of x by 2 pi, almost like we are cutting out. So that if you were to multiply the integral by 2 pi, like 2 pi r, then what you're getting is the circumference of each circle. So that's actually a really interesting question. If you have, uh, let's do a little side note here. If you have volume equals the integral of area, Right, so that's why we're using pi r squared. Um, so we get sort of the volume of the entire shape. What is it when we, what do we get when we integrate circumference? Yeah, yeah, you're going to get surface area, right? Because if you take the edge of every single piece and then you like add them all up together, you're going to end up with the surface area, okay? So great question, like what happens if we have 2 pi r versus pi r squared? You're going to end up with the surface area instead of the uh, volume. So that's why your answers don't match. Got it. Cool, very cool. 
Um, so you actually talk about surface area and arc length uh, a lot more in Calc 2 and in Calc 3. We don't touch upon it quite so much um, here. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, so let's go with this one, another question which gives us a bunch of pictures um, so that we can kind of scaffold this learning for ourselves in terms of how does this picture connect to the actual shape we're doing, all right? So this question says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the region bounded by y equals the square root of x and the y-axis from zero to three about the y-axis, all right? So let's just kind of go through where they're getting all of these uh, things in their picture from. And so we notice that we've got a function, a blue one, y equals x squared. That corresponds to the square root of x uh, blue line on the diagram. The y-axis, right, the y-axis, is sort of the other bound right here. And then um, zero to three, where do we see zero to three on this diagram? Where do we see that zero to three? On the y-axis, exactly. And so this, zero to three actually gives us sort of like, when do we stop counting these circles, All right? Now we are gonna be rotating around the y-axis, that is our axis of revolution, okay? So we are revolving around that. Now, given every info, all this information so far, are we thinking that we want to draw our purple lines vertically or horizontally? Like what's our gut tell us about whether we should look at these vertically or horizontally? Okay, so we've got one guess for vertical that our lines are gonna be going this way. Okay, now what do we think about those lines? I mean, I think they all have the same top curve and the same bottom curve. So that part checks out. Like if we were finding area, I think we would be totally good to go. But why might this not be great if I want to sort of achieve pictures of this funnel looking thing below? Ah, okay, so we're rotating about the y axis, not the x axis. And so that's something we wanna note that when we are rotating, we need to know which axis, okay? So we do horizontal, not vertical. Yes, okay, okay. So I'm gonna get rid of these purple lines, okay? Because if we take a look at them this way, right? So in other words, stacking from zero to three up the y-axis, right? And I get this and I get this. This would be sort of like the biggest circle all the way at the top, all right? Now, I'm wondering if you can tell me, um, let's look at these pictures. This purple one, this real big circle all the way at the top, what's the radius of that circle? All right, so David says this radius is nine. Okay, I would agree with that, that radius is nine. How do we write that as some sort of function notation? Okay, 
Maybe let's try a different example and see if that helps us unpack our understanding a little bit more. So let's say that we had this circle. Oh gosh. What is the radius of this circle? We think maybe it's about six. Okay. What about if I had a circle that was right at one? So like a little baby circle down here. What's the radius of that? Mm. I bet you could get even more exact if you looked at this diagram. A circle that is at y equals one has a radius of one, okay? All right, so at y equals one, the radius is one. At y equals what can I write here for the first one? At y equals what? The radius is nine. At y equals three, the radius is nine. Okay. Let's make this middle one a nicer number. Let's make this one a nicer number. At y equals two, what is the radius? Four, okay. All right, so at y equals three, the radius is nine. At y equals two, the radius is four. At y equals one, the radius is one. What about this at y equals three halves? What do we think the radius is? Let's throw some not nice numbers in there. See if we think we figured out a pattern. y equals three halves. What is the radius? Ooh, nine fourths. You are correct. Nine fourths. All right. At y equals five halves, what do we think the radius is? Ooh, 25 fourths. All right, all right. At y equals some number, what is our radius? Bingo, some number squared. Some number squared. So mathematical, right? Exactly, number squared. So at y equals some number, the radius is gonna be some number squared. Now I argue that they actually told you that somewhere in the question. Where in the question did they actually give you this pattern? Oh, all right, all right. This function right here, y equals the square root of x. That's great, right? But remember when we were talking about hints, like how do we know if it should be dx or dy? And one of our questions that we asked ourselves was, well, what are the bounds? Sometimes the bounds told us, right? From zero 
to three, if we're stacking those circles up the y-axis, we better be using dy. And we even drew our lines that way. These lines, we draw them going up the y-axis, it should be dy. But you know what they didn't do for you? They didn't give you an equation that's like x equals. That probably would have been the biggest hint of all, right? They didn't say x equals this, they said y equals this. And so sometimes when we see this, we need to be like a little bit smarter than the problem. We need to see through that trick and be like, okay, based on my picture, I drew these purple lines. They're going up the y-axis. These are y values. I'm gonna need everything to be in terms of y. And so all we need to do is we're gonna take this equation we're going to square both sides, so we're going to isolate x. So x equals y squared, right? So now we've got an x equals equation. And x turns out this y value, right? y, and when I square it, what does it give me? y squared gives me the radius. Okay, so y squared gives us the radius. So what this means is that in this case, each of these purple lines is the radius and the function we can use for it is y squared. Okay. So let's figure out how to plug these into our equation, all right? We want to find volume. Are we going to use uh, area equals pi r squared or area equals pi big r squared minus pi little r squared? Which one of those is going to serve us better in this scenario? Are we going to want pi r squared or pi big r squared minus pi little r squared? All right. Yeah, I agree. I say let's go with the pi r squared. We've got a filled donut situation because these purple lines, they sure do touch the axis of revolution. Okay, and when we look at the 3D pictures, there's no hole in the funnel, like it's a solid shape. There's no hole in the middle. So, oops, let's cross that off our list before we move too far. So not this one. All right, so we're gonna start the same way. Volume equals the integral of area. And in this time, we're going to put dy instead of dx because we're stacking these circles up the x-axis. Okay. Now, we know that because we are rotating, we have the integral of pi radius squared dy. And we know even that our bounds are going to be, as they said here, from 0 to 3. So we have a bottom bound of zero, a top bound of three. All right, the last thing we need to plug in is a function for the radius. So let's pull this pi out to the front, the integral from zero to three. And instead of radius, I'm gonna write y squared dy. Okay, so y squared dy because every time I wanted to find a radius, all I did was take the y value and square it. The y value and square it. The y value and square it. And so if I wanna say that in general, I just say y squared, okay? Before I move forward though, 
what is my mistake? Ah, eagle eye here this morning, right? My radius is y squared. But if I want radius squared, I better have square on the outside. Okay, so you want to be really careful that you kept the structure of the formula. Whatever you put in radius, I don't care if it has a square in there, you still have to square that quantity because it's radius squared. Okay. And so I think this one will end up a lot nicer than the first question. We'll get pi, the integral from zero to three of y to the fourth dy. That might be one of the nicest integrals you've seen in a very long time. And I'll leave that for you to do in the privacy of your own uh, study place. And you should end up with 243 pi over five. Okay. So how are we feeling with this second example here? Feeling okay, not okay. <laughs> All right. I think area and volume, again, it is one of those where it seems to come so easily for some people and less easily for other people, and that is okay. Um, if you are one of those people where it feels like it's not coming easily to you, that's okay. All right. It doesn't mean that you can't get to where you want to be. It just means that we need to think about different strategies and visualization and, and how do we do all of that piece. All right. But I would say the best thing you can do for yourself is think about the decision making we use as we kind of go along. All right. So from here on out, we're going to be taking a look at questions that are a lot less structured. So like what happens if there's no picture? They just give you a bunch of words and you're supposed to come up with a picture. Okay, so let's see. Example eight says determine the volume of the solid obtained from rotating the region bounded by y equals one over x and the y axis from one to three about the y axis. So as I'm setting up a grid here to sketch this, I would love for folks to type in the chat what their guess is for whether your integral will be dx or dy, all right? Two letters, that's all, dx or dy. What are your thoughts? All right, all right. So it seems to me that pretty much everyone is saying dy, okay? And that is indeed the correct answer, all right? Now, what are some clues before we start drawing the picture about why would we wanna say dy? In fact, why is it not dx, right? What are the clues that tell us that? about the y-axis. Okay, I wanna be really careful about that because in 6.3, that's not going to be true. Okay, so it isn't that you're wrong, right? It works in this scenario and it's not always gonna work. So what are some other clues here that might help us see that we're going to have dy instead of dx? Yeah, the y-axis. So these are y values. And so if they're having a stack along that y-axis, um, that is one indicator of we're going to need dy. Okay. Um, it'll be a little easier to think about like why we need to, like what other features from the picture are going to be helpful. Um, 
but let's do this problem and then we'll summarize that piece. Okay. Uh, anyone happen to remember what y equals one over x looks like? That was one of those random, random graphs. Remember what one over x looks like. It's one of those weird ones. Yeah, exactly. So we've got sort of two different branches here, right? We've got this one up in the quadrant one, and then we've got its corresponding piece down in quadrant three. Perfect. Okay. So we have these two branches. Now we are in particular looking for y values from one to three. So do we need both branches? We're looking only from y equals one to three. Yeah, I would say we don't need the one in quadrant three, right? We only need the one in quadrant one. Perfect way to summarize that, David. We only need the one from quadrant one, okay? So let's go ahead and sketch that here. If I only want the branch in quadrant one, then I'm looking to have this piece right here. Okay. Now, if I'm looking at my axis of revolution, which is right here, all right, when I revolve this around the other, around that axis of revolution, it might seem that it sort of has a matching piece, like so. Now, this is one of the strategies that for me has helped me figure out the diagram piece where I can't necessarily draw fancy three-dimensional things, but what I can show myself is that I'm gonna have the original and then whatever line I draw is gonna sort of create circles like this. Maybe I have like a bigger circle down here. All right. But these circles are kind of coming out of the screen at you and going back into the screen. So they're kind of like stacking up that y axis. Okay. So again, I find this dotted line sort of reflection piece to be helpful. If that's not helpful to you, then you don't have to do it, but I would give it a try and see if that feels like it's something that might be beneficial to you. Okay. But maybe we should also mark off our y equals one. So maybe that's like down here and our y equals three, y equals three, y equals one. And then if we were to think about drawing those purple lines, I think it becomes a little bit more clear that we could draw them this way, okay? Now those purple lines, what do those represent after I have rotated something about the y-axis? Represents the radius, good, good, good. So radius, there's only one, so that might cue us to think pi r squared. And so what we need to figure out is what do we write for our radius, right? What is the expression we can use for our radius? So let's think about this in terms of some numbers. Um, at y equals one, what is the radius of that circle, the one at the very bottom? So at y equals one, we've got the very bottom circle. What's the radius of that circle? A little harder now, because I didn't have a grid all set up for you, right? But how do we find that radius? Hmm, yeah, that radius actually, in fact, is one. Okay, let's try a few more. At y equals two, the radius is, what do we think? Well, maybe before we get that value, do we think that radius at two is bigger or smaller? 
like as we go up our stack of circles. Yeah, it's going to get smaller, right? And yeah, um, David and Megan, I think you are correct. We've got a radius here of one half. All right, let's do one more for good measure. What happens when we get to the top of our little volcano looking situation? At three, at y equals three, what's our radius? Mm, one third, okay, okay. So if we wanted to generalize this, right? So at y equals some value, the radius is going to equal what? How do we write that? I mean, it might be the x value, but we can't just have an x value, we need to know like what we might want to do as sort of an equation piece, right? And so, yeah, I would say that that radius is the x value, but maybe a general way of stating that is one over some value. Right. Now, this, right? This some value, this is a y value. So we have an x value is equal to one over a y value. Turns out they played that same trick on us again. They gave us this equation, y equals one over x. But as soon as we see that our, I'm going to spoil surprise here. Now that we see that our lines, our radius, are perpendicular to that axis of revolution, right? So the radius is perpendicular to that axis of revolution. That means we're gonna need to take this equation and get x by itself. So x equals, when I solve for x in that equation, what do I get? Instead of y equals one over x, what do I get when I isolate x? Yeah, we get one over y. And check out one over y is the same as one over some y value, right? So the patterns that you all noticed right here helped you get the formula, which told you what you needed to do to that equation. All right. Let's set up our integral. Volume equals the integral of area dy. All right, bounds are from one to three of pi radius squared dy. I'm gonna pull the pi out to the front, integral from one to three. Instead of radius, what am I gonna put? one over y, exactly, one over y. Don't forget that squared dy. Now I'm gonna leave you to integrate this on your own. I will tell you the answer, but what rule are you gonna need when you integrate this? So let's talk about decision-making, right? What rule are you gonna to need to integrate one over y squared? That is exactly what I was hoping you would say. It is unfortunately incorrect. Can't use u sub here. I don't see a natural log of y. Yeah, okay. This is one of those situations, and this was a, something I noticed on the exam, is some of us tried to go immediately to the hardest method without taking a moment to say, let me simplify this first and see what happens, okay? 
So if we were to take a moment and simplify, we would end up with the integral from one to three of one over y squared. This is very much the power rule, right? Just like Ethan said, we've got y to the negative two. So we're gonna need power rule here. All right. So again, I'll leave those computations up to you, but at the end, we should end up with two pi over three. So I spoiled a surprise earlier, right? I said one word in particular. I said that the radius was, had what kind of relationship with the axis of symmetry or axis of revolution? How are these lines related to each other? They're perpendicular. Okay, so when you're drawing your pictures, we need to be thoughtful about what makes sense for the purple lines. But everything that we learn today is under disk and washer method because the radius is perpendicular to the axis of revolution. So if we sort of go back up and just verify that that's true, this radius sure is perpendicular to that axis of revolution. So if you draw that purple line and it's perpendicular to your axis of revolution, you're gonna wanna use washer or disc method, okay? Let's do one more check. These purple lines right here sure are perpendicular to that axis of revolution. That's another clue that we wanna choose from these two formulas instead of a third formula we're gonna learn later on, okay? So if you draw them and they're perpendicular, go with the pi r squared or the big pi r squared minus the little one. Perpendicular, perpendicular, perpendicular. All right. Do we want to do one more that has the filled in area or are we ready to envision things that might be more of a washer situation or a uh, like a regular donut situation? How are we feeling? Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this example, all right? So uh, the vol determine the volume of the solid obtained from rotating the region. Okay, rotating, I'm gonna have circles, so pi r squared. And this region is bounded by x squared minus four x and y equals zero. And I'm revolving it around the x axis. So, as I'm setting up the grid, if someone could sort of tell me some characteristics about this graph that I could use to help sketch a picture, x squared minus 4x, that would be really helpful. All right, it is an upward facing parabola, but let's be a little bit more specific. Do we know anything else about this or can we use algebra that we know to find out anything else about this? Uh, it is not to the right form, okay? It is not to the right form. What's our strategy when we have 
something like this. We want to sketch it a little bit more accurately. Okay, that's fair. You don't know what to do with the 4x, but how can we sort of sidestep that? We don't need to always use just the graph transformation. We have some other tools that we can use to help us sketch. Good guess, but no. Yes, we do factor, all right? What happens when we factor? Like, what does factoring help us find? Yes, I agree. X parentheses, X minus four, but what is the purpose of factoring? Because sometimes we like list out steps, but we don't always know why they're happening. So what is the benefit of writing it as Christina suggested? because I think she is spot on. Yes, okay, so that is the key here. We can use this to help us find the x-intercepts. In fact, x equals zero and x equals four are x-intercepts. So I know it's an upward facing parabola, but I also know that it's gonna go through zero, zero and four, zero, okay? So I noticed that some of us are doing a great job of saying, okay, when I see this kind of problem, here's step one, here's step two, here's step three. But what sometimes I feel like is missing is like, do you know why you're doing those steps, right? Like, what does that actually help you find? So make sure you make that connection real tight for yourselves. You're factoring so that you can find the x-intercepts. And what we end up with is just this bottom part of the parabola. Ah this bottom part of the parabola, all right? And we are taking this and we know that the other function that is bounding this is y equals zero. Now, what does y equals zero look like? Like if I were to sketch that here, what does y equals zero look like? That's just the x-axis, exactly. So what we really got here is something like this, right? So we're taking that area below the x-axis and we are, as we've seen on some of those diagrams, they sort of draw like a little rounded arrow thing to say, oh, I'm revolving it around this axis, okay? So if I were to think about what that might, how, what might happen is when I'm done, I'll end up with sort of like a kind of like a sphere, but not quite looking situation. And our axis of revolution is just this piece here. All right. So ways to make your graph even more specific, all right? Making sure that you're annotating everything on that diagram. Last piece for the diagram, which direction do our purple lines go? Vertically or horizontally? Yeah, I would say vertically. Now we want to make sure we draw them in the right region, the correct region. I don't want to draw them up here because that's not where my function was originally. I want to draw them rather between the two curves that I was given. So orange, pink, orange, pink, orange, pink.
each of these purple lines represents a radius, right? Every single purple line is a radius. And let's try this with a few numbers. At x equals two radius equals what? At x equals two, what does the radius equal? Mm, okay, okay, so we get a, a negative value. Hmm, okay. At x equals one, what do we think the radius is? Hmm, negative three. All right, at x equals three, what do we think the radius is? negative three again. Okay. How did you all find these values? Right? How did you find these values? Hmm. So at x equals a number, then radius equals number squared minus four times that number. Mm, okay, okay. Now, let's think about this for a moment. If we sort of rewind in our brains to last week when we were just doing two dimension, and I said, I want you to find the area between two curves. And these are my two curves. If I wanted to find that area. All right, so let's rewind. I just want to find the area. I maybe would say the integral from zero to four. But if I wrote this, I would be wrong. I would be incorrect. Why is that not quite correct? Oh, top function minus bottom function. Okay, so if we were to do top function minus bottom function, okay. So we would need zero minus that, right? Top function minus the bottom function. So to be accurate, I would need to do zero minus x squared minus four x, okay? so that we have our top function, we have our bottom function. Well, I would argue that we potentially, and by potentially, I mean definitely, made that same mistake when we were trying to figure out the radius. So at x equals two, I would say the radius is not negative. What might 
that radius be? Ah, it is positive four. Okay. So let me go back in and do a positive four. That means that x equals one, the radius is not negative three, but it is positive three. And at x equals three, the radius is positive three, okay? So we need to modify our general formula. At x equals a number, the radius equals radius equals zero minus f of that number, okay? So we need to preserve this idea of if there's a top function and a bottom function, we still need to account for them. So this zero means that we're going to take this function and actually just change the signs of them. So it'll be like negative x squared plus 4x. All right, so we know that area, the volume equals the integral of area dx, all right? Why am I so quick to say dx here? Because of the vertical lines, okay? So these ones are vertical, so I'm sort of stacking them along the x-axis. And I can use the pi r squared that's going to come in the next step because these lines are perpendicular to that axis of revolution. So we'll get pi, whoop, the integral from zero to four of pi radius squared dx. And we'll get pi, the integral from 0 to 4. Instead of radius, I'm going to do 0 minus x squared minus 4x squared dx. So whatever I sort of generalized for my radius, that goes in for radius. Right? We're substituting here, very fancy substitution. All right, so let's see. I see a square, I see some negatives, I see some opportunity for sign mistakes. So if I were to clean this up, I might get negative x squared plus 4x, and I'm going to square that. I do want to make sure that I FOIL out or distribute. And once I integrate, I end up with a rather large value of 512 pi over 5. Or 15, sorry, 15. So how are we feeling here? Are there any downsides to using U sub? Um, I don't think this is a U sub question. What would your U be in this question? Ah, uh, so if you have negative x squared plus four x as your U, your du is going to be negative 2x plus 4. 
and I don't see anything close to negative 2x plus 4 that I can sort of substitute out. Yeah, yeah. So that's sort of the weird thing. I think with chain rule, it's a little bit more like what you're thinking. But with u sub, we need to make sure that there is something that matches that du. Otherwise, we're just making it more complicated than it needs to be. OK? So if you were to think about it like the way, like a strategy, I would try algebraically simplifying first. That gets you pretty far. OK, so distributing properly or splitting into multiple fractions, that that's a lot of bang for your buck right there. You can avoid a lot of uh, grosser things if you do those things. Then I would say U sub is sort of next up in the things that you should try. And then when you get to Calc 2, there's a bunch more stuff you should try. But you should always try things that we learned in Calc 1 first before trying some of the more complicated stuff. All right. So yes, and so we could, all right? So we could use symmetry here to say, let me find this volume here, and then I'm going to double it so that I get both sides. That would be absolutely fine, OK? So if you want to split your, uh, your integral, and you could say, or pi uh, two pi the integral from zero to two of this squared dx that would be fine as well. Okay, so I think symmetry can be useful um, in these sort of situations. All right, might keep the numbers a little bit small. All right, so. I think we have time to take a look at the uh, what happens when we have more of a regular donut looking situation, um, but we will finish up the rest of this on Wednesday. Okay, so we will finish up whatever we don't complete today on Wednesday. All right, so disk method. Okay, so disk. Disk method is what we've been doing so far. Disk method is that filled in donut, the frosting filled donut that I love so much, or the jelly filled donut, or whatever might be inside of that donut, right? It is a solid, uh, a solid breakfast, a solid snack. Uh, there's no holes in it. And so we can get away with just saying pi little r squared, okay? But what we're about to see is that sometimes we're going to take a look at those purple lines that we drew. And these purple lines, all right, will actually have a gap or a space between the purple line and the axis of revolution. So if you draw your purple lines and it doesn't go all the way to your axis of revolution, then we're going to need to think about this as washer method. We have to sort of subtract out that smaller piece so that we can get just the area we want and nothing more. OK. And so if we think about this right here, typically what we have is we have two functions. Let's see how poorly I can do this. So we've got sort of like one function that when we revolve it, it goes pretty wide out. And then we have a second function that doesn't go quite as far out. And this one we would say is our little r. And as their diagram says, like this, from the center all the way out is the big R, OK? And we have our axis of revolution going right through the middle. And so if you were to describe to me which one is the big R and which one is the little r, how could you describe that? Like, how are you going to know from a picture whether something is the big R or something is the little r?
Mm, okay. So one way that we could think about this is that the larger radius is sort of the bigger one or what we might call the top function. Let's, however, sort of return to this picture for a moment. Let's say that I had uh, like an inner radius here. I think the green function is clearly above the pink function, but which one of those is the bigger radius? The pink one, okay. So maybe top and bottom is not the best way to think about it because what if it's underneath the x-axis or if it's turned sideways, like we're looking at dy versus dx. And so maybe another way of saying that, we could say that it is the uh, function further away from the axis of revolution. Yeah, yeah. So inner or outer, right? So this one we could think about as like the outer function. So it has a greater distance from your axis of revolution. Whereas the smaller radius will be defined by the function that is closer to the axis of revolution. And we might think of that one as the inner one, okay? So sometimes it'll be top minus bottom, but the biggest thing we're really looking for is that distance. Which one is further away? Which one is closer? All right, let's see if we can't talk through this question before we take off for the day. All right, so example 10 will be our last example today, and then we'll finish it up on Wednesday. Um, but example 10 says, determine the volume of the solid obtained by rotating the portion of the region bounded by y equals the cube root of x and y equals x over 4 that lies in the first quadrant about the y-axis. And so I've got my axis of revolution right here. If I were to color code, um, there's sort of a blue function and a red function. Which one is the blue function? All right, in the picture, there's a blue function. Which one of those equations represents the blue function? Yeah, that linear one, right? So this linear one is going to be that blue line. And then the red one will be that cube root. All right, so that's kind of a strategy I use. I'm like, if I'm not super confident about like what a shape is, I'll try and figure out one that I know, all right? And so x over 4, we know that's a line. And so that has to match with the blue one, OK? Now we've got these fancy pictures here, all right? We've got these fancy pictures. So we've got the blue function, which is like here. And then that would be sort of like after it's revolved. And then we've got this red function here. And this is after it's revolved. And we've got our axis of revolution going right down the middle there. OK, and as you can kind of tell from the subsequent pictures, we've got sort of this one is the blue or the red function. And then this one is the blue function. And so based on which one we talked about, what do we think is going to be the big radius and what do we think is going to be the small radius?
So is the big radius going to correspond to the blue curve or the red curve? Yeah, that blue function is greater. It's further away from that axis of revolution, right? It's this one right here, which has a greater distance away. That means that the little radius must be the red function. Okay. Now, we have not done our purple lines. So which direction should we draw those purple lines? Yeah, we've got horizontal, got horizontal, got horizontal. Okay. Now these lines are perpendicular to my axis of revolution. And these purple lines, in fact, they represent the difference between my big radius and my little radius. Do these purple lines, are they perpendicular to my axis of revolution? Yes, right, these purple lines or are all perpendicular to that axis of revolution. Do those purple lines all touch the axis of revolution? No, okay. So like down here, it might touch the axis of revolution, but up here, that little line definitely does not touch that axis of revolution. And so that is another indicator that we're going to need a big radius and a little radius. Okay. So let's set up our integral. Volume equals the integral of area dx or dy. Yeah, we're going to go dy. Okay. Now, because I know there's going to be sort of like a part that's been scooped out of this volume, I want to make sure that I write an equation that incorporates that. So the integral of pi big R squared minus pi little r squared dy. And I'm going to start counting from zero. I'm going to finish counting at, where am I going to finish counting? I'm going to start counting at zero. Where do I stop counting? Nice, nice. We're going to stop counting at two, right? Because we're going up the y-axis and two is the biggest number up there. So zero to two of pi big R squared minus pi little r squared. Now we said earlier, usually it's easier just to bring the pi out to the front, right? So you can skip right to this step if that suits your fancy. But what we need to do now is define big R and little r, okay? So let's go back up to the question. They told me that little r is the cube root of x and that little, the big R is y equals x over four. So if I take these and put them into my function, my equation, then I would have something like this. pi integral from zero to two of x over four squared minus cube root of x squared dy.
What are our thoughts? Too many variables, right? We're not in Calc 3. We're not looking to do multivariable calculus yet. And if we did, we would need a whole other set of rules, right? So I don't want x over 4. I don't want cube root of x. But what I can done is something that this diagram has sneakily already done for us. Look at what they did. They isolated x in both of those. So instead of y equals x over 4, they put x equals 4y. And instead of y equals cube root of x, they put x equals y cubed. So if we use those functions instead, or those names, then we'll get this minus this. Now we've got everything with y. Okay, we've got a lot of algebra here. We got a square, we got a square, we got to integrate, we got to do all that work. But at the end, we should end up with this. So this might be a good way to start the integral as long as you know, you have to make everything with respect to y. Okay, so we only want one variable going on. If we have a dy at the end, everything should have y's. If we have a dx at the end, everything should have dx's, all right? So we need to make sure that things match. That always makes math very happy. And then we can rinse and repeat, work through all the things we know about integrals and get to this solution. All right. So this is just a taste of what we're going to continue talking about on, uh, on Wednesday. Uh, ooh, quick question, how do you figure out the top bound? Where did the two come from? Well, if we are looking for dy, then we know we should use y values for the bounds. So from the graph, I could say zero all the way up to two, right? But we know that we might need to show things algebraically sometimes. So we could say uh, cube root of x equals x over four, like we could set them equal to each other. We could cube both sides. And we could solve and get those values, all right? I would argue that it might be more beneficial to solve the y one since we're interested in y values, okay? Okay, cool. So algebra is always here to support you, especially when we get to the questions where there's no diagram. We wanna make sure we know how to do that, okay? All right, so. That was a lot for today, a lot for a Monday morning. Um, but let's go ahead and